Hey guys, before we jump into our conversation with John August, I want to quickly mention that Beyond the Screenplay has a Patreon. If you're enjoying the podcast, we would really appreciate you heading over to our Patreon and supporting the show. For $2 a month, you get access to two patron-exclusive episodes, as well as exclusive Q&As where the team will answer questions and discuss topics suggested by our patrons. So head to patreon.com slash beyondthescreenplay, or click the link in the show notes to become a patron. Now, on to our conversation with John August. Hi. I'm Michael, and welcome to a very special episode of Beyond the Screenplay. Uh, today, I'm joined by the Lessons from the Screenplay writing peoples, <laughs> writer <laughs> Trisha Arand. Good morning, everybody. Writer Brian Bittner. Hello. And we have a very special guest with us today. Our guest is a screenwriter whose credits include Go and Big Fish, Charlie's Angels, Titan A.E., Charlie and the Chocolate Factory, Corpse Bride, Frank and Weenie, and most recently, <laughs> Aladdin. He's the co-host of the super popular podcast, Script Notes. He's an app developer. He basically does everything. Mm -hmm. John August, welcome to the show. It is a pleasure to be here. Awesome. Um, so yeah, we're we're really excited to have you here. And and so one of the first things I wanted to uh, just ask you is what what is it that you love about storytelling? Like you've done so many forms of storytelling and all these different mediums. What is it that makes you passionate about telling stories? You know, I've always been a person who created elaborate worlds in my head and sort of imagined, you know, characters doing things in those worlds and writing or any other kind of storytelling is a way of taking this idea, this story that's in my head and getting it into other people's heads. And so it's a way of propagating these ideas out into the world. So that's not just me seeing a thing, it's other people seeing a thing. Hmm. Yeah. Awesome. Yeah. That's, I feel like that's uh, a universal thing. I think I've seen in storytellers is that I, what I like about stories is that it's a very generous process. It's sharing an emotion mm -hmm. or an experience with people and, it's a form of communicating, which I, I really enjoy. Absolutely. So one of the things I want to talk about is, you know, on Lessons from the Screenplay, our YouTube channel, it's very much about analyzing story and theory and looking at structure and kind of dissecting films. But we don't really get to talk about the actual writing process, like how you take a blank piece of paper and turn it into a story that works in all these different ways. So I was wondering if you could kind of talk about your process, like when you're beginning a story, what is the first step? What's the first thing you do? Yeah, most stories begin with an idea feels too abstract, but there's there's an image, there's a character, there's a feeling that you're trying to get to. And it, you know, I often say that your brain is a bunch of competing processes that are like trying to get more process, you know, we get more computer processing time. And so they will manipulate things. So like, no, 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 think about me, think about me, think about me. And mm -hmm. the, the winning ideas are the ones that sort of com are able to compete the best and sort of get the most brain cycles. And those are the ones that have just something that is new and interesting and, uh, and, and makes you want to pay more attention to them. So it's it's not often that a whole idea comes together or it's this character on this journey, but it's it's a bunch of things that sort of conspire together to get you to pay attention to them. And eventually you can't stop thinking about them. Mm -hmm. And when that happens, those are the projects that you end up writing generally, or at least you know consider writing. It's interesting because I think it's something I think about with with movies. Sometimes you see a movie, then you're like, "There was nothing wrong with it," but I forgot about it the next day. And I think sometimes it is that that extra kernel of something, which mm -hmm. I think is what you're what you're talking about, where you don't know quite why, but something just sticks in your mind for some extra mm -hmm. reason. Yeah. yeah, absolutely. There's that Velcro quality to it, and just like it clings to the <laughs> edges of your of your of your mind. And no matter how hard you try to scrape it off, it just keeps coming back. And those are the projects that you know, I, I will tend to actually start writing and will sort of put the time to fill out the rest of it. And I think a lot of people have that sort of core good idea, that thing they keep coming back to, but they don't have the the tools or the discipline or the the craft to be able to you know bring it into its full form. So that this idea that exists only in their head will also work in other people's heads. I'd be curious to hear what you think about uh, it, the role that inspiration plays. Because, you know, the way that you're talking about it, it's like, well, it sounds a little like mystical or nebulous. Like, oh, so I have this idea and it's, it's stuck in my brain. But 
is that like I think a lot of writers get stuck on like I don't feel inspired I can't write this today um and like what would you say to that so like I guess that comes back to the process piece well part of what you're describing is often how we see in movies where like the the writer pulls the sheet of paper out of the typewriter and crumbles it up and it yeah, yeah, feels yeah. like overwhelming. <laughs> right. uh, there's a trash can that's overflowing with these couple <laughs> of pieces of paper. Um, and that generally is not my experience at all as a writer, and it's, nor is it most people's experience as a writer. But there's sort of two things that happen. One is that you uh, you don't know how to do the thing, like because it's actually, it's a hard craft to do. And, mm -hmm. you know, yeah. it's, it's, it's mentally exhausting to do it. Sometimes you just don't want to do that work, just like some people don't want to, you know, go swim the laps they need to swim because they're, a, you know, a, a star athlete. Mm -hmm. um, but the other thing that I think sometimes happens is that you you know that it's just not going to quite work right. You know you have a bunch of puzzle pieces that aren't going to quite fit together, and you don't, you can't see a way to make them all fit together. And that's a thing that you can sense it, but until mm -hmm. you actually try to do it, you can't really... Uh, get working there. And so, so often I find the frustrations of places that are going back to look at successful movies is they're only, they're missing all the silent evidence of all the movies that didn't work or all the right. previous versions that didn't work. Cause like, and we compare ourselves as writers to these amazing mm -hmm. masterpieces that actually shot versus like this jumble of words that we see on the paper. And we're forgetting all the work it took to get there and all the false steps. Yeah. And I wonder, um, like, so you do a lot of adaptation and stuff like that. So this this germ of an idea that sort of came out of nowhere, you know, that you then get stuck on and you end up writing. When that's not the case, when you're handed something else, is it the same kind of way that you need to find yourself into it? Yes. And Aladdin is a great example of that because I've been approached to do an Aladdin movie mm -hmm. 10 years ago. And it's like, oh my God, I would, I could never do a lot. I have no idea what to do with that. And I, and I could see all the problems. I couldn't see the solutions mm -hmm. to those problems. And then I was reapproached about, Hey, would you consider doing an Aladdin? And, uh, that was right after Cinderella had done so well. Mm -hmm. And I could take a look at Cinderella. So like, Oh, you know what Cinderella did, which was so smart is that it was exactly the story of Cinderella, but they gave the characters human motivations rather than cartoon motivations. And everything rippled out of that fundamental decision. And so I could say like, oh, I now actually know how to do Aladdin. It's, you know, the same basic piece of story. But when you give those characters real human dimensional problems and, and you know, goals and obstacles, uh, it does transform the story. And that was my way into thinking about Aladdin as a live action movie. Mm -hmm. We have all seen it, and <laughs> we would love to talk to you more about it, if you're willing. Yeah, absolutely. So, and, and I'll preface this by saying that the movie that's on screens right now, mm -hmm. I like it. Uh, it is not the movie I intended at the start. And mm -hmm. so we can talk about some of the things that changed, and that is the process of being a screenwriter, is that um, you are not the final voice on a lot of things. And there are things in the movie that I, I don't agree with, um, and that's happens as a screenwriter but i can certainly talk to you about uh, intention going into it yeah we'd love to hear that <laughs> well yeah i think i think that's important because i think anybody who knows anything about the industry knows especially if you're writing for a, a powerhouse like disney your script is probably not going to be entirely what ends up on screen but i think what we don't know is sort of the point a to point b and what happens in between not you know certain things you probably don't want to talk about but uh, <laughs> but you know just sort of like what your original idea was and then how that how that developed yeah Sure. So I will say that, you know, in, in approaching Aladdin, it wasn't, they didn't come to me saying like, hey, would you do Aladdin for us? It was one of many ideas brought up at a general meeting. I immediately see it on and said like, I, I know how to do this. I, I can see, I can feel it. And most of the movies that I'm excited to write, like, you know, it does kind of come in a flash, like, here's all the things. This is what this movie is going to feel like. This is what it's going to sound like. This is what the experience of, of being in that movie is going to be like. Mm -hmm. It's generally, I can... I could picture myself sitting in the screen and sitting in a theater watching the big screen and kind of dic writing down what I'm seeing and what I'm hearing. It's, it's just, it's it's transcribing in some ways the experience of what the final movie is going to be. Yes. So a lot of screenwriting is just watching a movie in your head and <laughs> trying to find the best words you can to describe what that movie is. And hopefully with those right words, um, getting everyone else to see the same movie that you're trying to, that, that, you that can you're see. just... You, yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. So I'm just I'm just trying to convey this movie that I'm watching. Like, just watch this movie with me. <laughs> yes. And that's why um, so often, yeah, you know, people will complain about like 
we see or we hear in screenplay um, description, it's like, well, of course, because that's really what we're trying to do mm -hmm. is we're really trying to get these people to join the experience of watching this movie with us. Um, so in the case of Aladdin, I, you know, I'm watching this movie in my head and it's like I'm seeing, you know what, Jasmine, you know, she's the heir to the throne of Agrabah. Why are we not talking about how the fact that she is going to inherit this kingdom? Mm -hmm. If we do that, what is going to change? And like, well, she certainly has a lot more of an agenda. She has things that she wants that are different than the original movie, and that's great. Mm -hmm. um, if she's going to do this thing, I need to have somebody she can talk to about this stuff so that it's not just her dad and Aladdin. Like, we really can see what it is she's going through. So giving her a best friend, mm -hmm. her handmaiden, uh, Bahim Dahlia, looking at Aladdin, like, well, what does Aladdin actually want? I mean, he's he's poor, but he's actually pretty successful as a thief there. What is, is he really going for? What does Diamond in the Rough actually mean? Mm -hmm. That was a much bigger plot line sort of in mind, original yeah. section, but mm -hmm. it was just his going after to find, find this thing um, that he was always told that he was a Diamond in the Rough, but what did that actually mean? So that... Mm -hmm. Looking at Jafar in terms of like not being this magical character, but like, what does Jafar actually want? What is his goal? Is he just this kind of wizard who wants to rule things? Or what is his true agenda? How can he be a father figure or sort of an uncle figure to Aladdin? How can he be hmm. manipulative with his words? So those are all the things that I'm thinking about. Like, these are the reasons that I got, I got excited about. Like, these are opportunities mm -hmm. to tell the same kind of story, but with human motivations. Yeah, it's a real challenge. I was thinking of pitching a video for uh, about the original Aladdin like a while ago. And so I went into a deep dive and started pulling it all apart. And it's true that the cartoon motivations are so glossed over and they kind of make no sense when you look at them. Yeah, finding that way to, yeah, I don't know, make them people, you know, instead of cartoons, I feel like would be the real challenge. And I think it's pretty successful, actually. Yeah. And I don't want to sort of diss cartoons because I think, you know, animation, even that sort of classic Disney animation, it knows what it is and it does itself, does what it does so incredibly ingeniously, but we cannot do those same things because if you literally just took the script for Aladdin, the animated movie, and had it with real actors, it would be absurd. It, it would mm -hmm. not, it wouldn't play. Yeah. So when you're talking about, you know, you have this vision of the movie that you're you're watching and you're just kind of frantically writing and trying to make everyone see that, is that, you know, you sort of mentioned that it, it does kind of come as a spark, but are there processes or habits that you put into place to kind of spend more time in that space and explore it? Or like, you know, as you were talking about all the different, like, uh, you know, new takes on Aladdin that you you could see. Like, does that all come at once? Is there some space you build for yourself to kind of help that you know come to life? Like, what are the ways that you kind of allow that to populate your brain? Well, with any adaptation, generally you're going in and you're pitching to the people who are going to make the decision about what your vision is. And so, in the case of Aladdin, I'm going in there to really pitch what is my new take. And in order to pitch that new take, I have to really come up with a new take. I need to be able to anticipate the questions they're going to ask and really think through stuff. And so I write up a document, but it's really just for me to read. It's, I, I, I would never give it to them um, mm -hmm. and it wouldn't make any sense to them, but it's just sort of a set of notes for like, these are the things that are important to me. This is what it's gonna feel like. It, for Aladdin, I also, I just did up art boards, which are just, you know, black art boards with, um, stuff, images I took from the internet, sort of showing what things felt like to me, because I needed to be able to, for them to see, this is what I think an Agrabah can look like that is actually grounded in a kind of reality. So mm -hmm. some stuff was pulled from Game of Thrones, but also from the other live action Disney movies, that sense of this is a physical place with actual gravity and real world stuff. I pitched Agrabah, it's, it's like the crossroads of the world. So we should see a lot of various cultural things coming through this place so that it's not just, you know, mm -hmm. you know, the it, it's not the Taj Mahal and it's not <laughs> any one specific thing in, in Middle Eastern architecture that it really is the Disney fantastical version of what this land could look like. Um, the same way that Beauty and the Beast is not really France and, you know, Cinderella is not really England. So you're trying to find, uh, you know, a visual way to describe what this world is going to look like so then you could talk about the characters and those pitches are really about th these are the, the journeys of the characters this is what's different and crucial to that pitch was also 
the framing device, which kind of only half exists in the final movie, which is the Will Smith character explaining to his young kids the story of Aladdin. And mm -hmm. in my version, it it Princess Brides it more often that we're coming back to those characters. Oh, okay. And we're, see, we're seeing that they're ultimately discovering that their father is the genie, mm -hmm. was the genie, and that, you know, why did he not get three wishes? And his three wishes were his three kids. That was Aww. the whole ending. <laughs> ah, so see? Yeah. <laughs> and so, and so I, you get that awe in the, the, the pitch. It's like, oh, well, that's a that's what makes this thing specific and unique. Yeah. Right. I did I did like that framing of the story though because it was it's the first scene I thought okay Will Smith's playing this other character for some reason whatever, you know. Uh -huh. and, yeah. um, and not that that's bad just sort of like okay it's one of those things where they just have that character like let's get him on screen soon and then it, I completely forgot about it and then when the movie finished and it was closed that way I was like oh yeah. <laughs> It's a cute. It's, yeah. So I'll, I'll I'll pitch you the, the initial vision of that is that Will Smith's character that we see there um, is a farmer, and he he's a farmer in the same kingdom as Cinderella. So we actually see Cinderella's carriage go past. Okay, so interesting. Rather than his kids looking at that big ship, they're looking at that carriage. And I wish I were a princess. I wish I were this. And like, be careful with wishes. The reason why he starts telling the story is there's a huge storm that comes and the house, that the, the little shack they live in starts flooding. And so he has to distract them with the story so they won't pay attention to sort of wow. how desperate their situation is. So we keep coming back to it. And every time we come back to it, it's worse and worse and worse. And they also get through it all. That did not survive into the, the finished movie, but that was the intention behind the framing device is that every time we came back to it, there was a real reason mm -hmm. why we were cutting back and forth between them. Disney said, we don't like all these stakes and conflict. Let's get rid of it. <laughs> <laughs> Not to talk out of school, but I think the general thing that happened between those initial drafts and you know actually making the movie was Beauty and the Beast was hugely successful right. and incredibly faithful to the original movie. Mm. And I, there was a definite interest in oh, we should make it more like the animated movie. And that was a frustration to me. Maybe in terms of box office, they were correct. But uh, that was my frustration. Totally. Yeah, that's really interesting. Hearing, yeah, the, the process and the reasons that things change and end up the way they are. Yeah. And so you'll often notice things in movies where like, why why was why is that character saying that line of dialogue? Well, what was that? It's like, oh, that used to set up a song and a song still mm -hmm. right. there. And mm -hmm. so th there's these little vestigial things that stick around from earlier drafts. Yeah. So I'm curious to drill down even deeper into your process. And so like, for instance, when you're putting together that document that you're going to bring in to, you know, pitch your, your take on Aladdin, like, is there a specific place that you start? Is there like, you know, a daily routine that you have? Do you sit at your computer and say like, I'm going to, you know, right now I'm just looking for images or right now I'm just going to free write this or that? Like, is there a, a starting place that you always go to when you're trying to create something like that? In the cases of Aladdin and a lot of other projects, I will kind of put together a lookbook, which is just like, these are the images that feel like um, they would be stills from the movie I'm imagining. And so then they don't have to fit together perfectly, but I'll try to get images of like, okay, this is who I kind of see as the characters. This is what the world feels like. And I'll just gather this together in a folder. And if helpful, I'll put them together. I'll print them or I'll put them in a, in a PDF. I don't use them as reference while I'm actually writing, but when I'm talking to other people about them, they're helpful. And in some cases, you know, one of those images will, even as I'm putting together the boards, I realize like, I feel like I'm missing a character here. I feel like there's a thing, there's a, a section that's missing and that will inform some story points in terms of like, oh, if we had a sequence that did this, that would be amazing. The document I'm writing, it's a pretty quick process. It's only two pages and it's just kind of my notes. It's really just a bit of a script for how I anticipate the conversation going in the room mm. um, as I'm pitching it. Generally in a pitch, you start by talking about what the project means to you, sort of like what is your point of connection to it. Mm -hmm. You start talking about the world and the, the, the principal characters and, and how you're meeting those principal characters and then kind of go through it. It's more like a trailer than like a screenplay. It's very much this is the feeling of it and giving you a sense of, you know, why you want to be in this movie um, rather than sort of beat by beat by beat. Gotcha. So they don't necessarily expect you to have, you know, the whole plot mapped out specifically. 
They generally don't. Some in some cases you'll have more, in some cases you'll have less. In the case of Aladdin, you know, everyone knows those sort of the basic plot, so I only have to really talk about mm-hmm. the things sure. that are are the big changes. Um, it's something like Big Fish, where I'm pitching off of a book that the the plot that I'm pitching has very little relationship to the book. Mm-hmm. Um, I do have to provide a bigger framework for like, here's how we're getting through these stories. These are the new things I'm added adding to it so that this all makes sense. Um, you know, Big Fish was a hard thing to pitch. Go would be an almost impossible thing to pitch. It doesn't, mm-hmm. it's not always an easy way to sort of um, to describe a story that is ultimately going to be pretty complicated. Yeah, absolutely. This episode of Beyond the Screenplay is brought to you by Curiosity Stream, a subscription streaming service for people who love to learn. Curiosity Stream has over 2,400 documentaries and nonfiction titles from some of the world's best filmmakers, including exclusive originals. Now, you may remember Alex talking about how much he loves undersea nature shows, and how I also find them fascinating but ultimately terrifying. Whichever end of the spectrum you're on, I think you'll be able to appreciate The Wonder of the Oceans and the three-part series Deep Ocean, narrated by David Attenborough one of the many nature documentaries available on Curiosity Stream. You can get unlimited access starting at just $2.99 a month. And for the Beyond the Screenplay audience, the first 31 days are completely free if you sign up at curiositystream.com screenplay and use the promo code screenplay during the signup process. That's screenplay, lowercase, and all one word. Thanks to Curiosity Stream for sponsoring this episode of Beyond the Screenplay. I'm really curious, though, you know, we're talking about live action Aladdin and you were um, it, or Disney, you know, sort of started at Cinder, the live action Cinderella sort of started the whole ball rolling on live yeah. action remakes of the the animated properties. <laughs> Get out of here, Brian. <laughs> um, and so I'm curious as to just what you think sort of about the overarching climate of trying to do that. What are sort of the challenges and the responsibilities of the studios and the writers here? Well, in the case of the live action Disney movies, uh, we've always gone back to the classic stories. We've, you know, we've told the story of Genesis a thousand times. Mm-hmm. You know, we, we we tell those those classic stories. And honestly, we're at a point in culture now where those classic Disney movies are our kind of mythology and our culture. So yeah, the same for way that sure. we're, we're same way we're telling the Superman story again and again. We we have to tell these stories again and again, and, and hopefully bring um, a new perspective to them. So I, I'm not as down on that as a lot of people are. Yeah, I do recognize that there's an opportunity cost just in terms of, you know, when you're making one of those movies, you're also kind of making a choice not to make another movie. And so right. you'd love to see more original movies that just do their own thing. But I think when we do those movies, sometimes we don't give them full credit. I mean, Black Panther, yes, it's an adaptation. It's a property that existed before, but it is groundbreaking mm-hmm. and we couldn't have gotten that movie if we hadn't done the superhero movies that led up to it. So I think even in, even given the frustration that we're, we seem to be so focused on just redoing these set stories, we are, they're enabling other new things to happen too. Yeah. Yeah. And it's, it is in our history to, to retell stories you know yeah. you look at like greek uh, greek plays it's it wasn't about coming up with an original story it was about how you told this story that everyone already knows yeah romeo and juliet it pre-existed shakespeare so. exactly i was gonna say shakespeare yeah yeah same thing yeah i guess i guess more specifically because writing for animation is so different than writing for live action mm. i'm really curious about that translation or like what are sort of the unique challenges about trying to operate in that space you just want to talk to john about titan a don't i you? desperately <laughs> want to talk to john about titan a. I'm, 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 but so um so i'll tell you that I, for a person with a, a bunch of animation writing credits i've not done a lot of the traditional animated writing the way that they're they're generally done i okay. haven't done that si- situation where um there is a big group and we're talking through every beat and we're figuring out like mm-hmm. how we're going to handle this moment at the end of the second act, and then I'm going off and writing the script, and everyone contributes. Most of the credits I have were really kind of written like live action features, mm-hmm. and so Titan A, I dropped in. I was there to do some dialogue polishing. It ended up being a little bit more than that because of changes to directors and everything else. Mm-hmm. Um, but I was basically they handed me the ball, I ran with it for twenty yards, and then I handed it off to somebody else. So it wasn't. 
that sort of big collaborative process that we think of for animation, the, the Pixar process, the Disney process. Right, right. The stop motion movies I did for Tim Burton, Corpse Bride and Frank and Weenie. Uh, again, I really wrote them kind of like live action features. It's just that I write a, I would write the script and rather than seeing, you know, dailies, I would see scratch reels and stuff and could and watch animatics along the way and I could offer notes on those, but it wasn't the the very collaborative room mm. process that you see in traditional animation. And there's there are going to be experiments in doing more live action features in that animated way. Mm -hmm. We'll see how that works. You know, a TV room works great for doing, you know, 10, 24 episodes of television. I don't know that it's going to work for live action features the same way. Mm -hmm. We'll see. As I was listening to that, I was thinking about one of the changes in Aladdin that I noticed was, I, if I remember the, the original cartoon, right in the beginning when Jasmine's kind of out in the streets and mm -hmm. she gets caught giving, you know, feeding the children uh the the man is gonna like chop off her hand uh -huh. right and, and so it was it was this weird moment where i was like oh wait but like he's not threatening to chop off her hand right. like in the cartoon but then i thought about like yeah threatening to chop off somebody's hand in a live action film has uh, <laughs> the consequences yeah. would be much more that it was just Cartoon hands are expendable. Yeah. <laughs> Absolutely. They only have four fingers anyway. So it doesn't, <laughs> that's true. It doesn't feel the same. I would say that's an example of the kinds of things that it's not just the times we're living in, but the fact that it is live action, that stuff does feel different. And there's moments in the, the live action movie that feel really cartoony to me that I wish didn't feel so cartoony. Mm -hmm. And finding that balance and that tone is tough. And, uh, you know, different people are have different opinions on sort of where that line should be drawn. So uh, that's a, a good example of sort of, you know, you want you want there to feel like there's stakes, but the stakes mm -hmm. have to match, you know, the overall universe you're building. Well, yeah, and I was thinking about this too because I, as I went with my neighbor, she's seven years old, and the only part that she was, she's quite skittish even for being seven, and the only part that she was really scared in is when like, Iago the bird, you know, turns into like this big evil bird. Mm. Uh -huh. That was pretty terrifying. And that is, yeah, <laughs> agree. I mean, it's very scary. But the original Aladdin, I remember being very upsetting to me when I was young for the reasons that you were talking about, Michael, where it's like we we absolutely believe that Jasmine might get her hand chopped off, you know, even just for a second. Um, and the Jafar character is incredibly menacing in the animated movie. And I, some of that, I wonder, like, they, they think they did exactly what they set out to do. And you can probably tell us more, John, uh, to make like a true family movie where, you know, even young children can come and see it. But yeah, they I feel like toned down some of that in the live action movie. Yeah, I, I got responses on Twitter saying like, why did you cut Jafar turning into the giant snake and, mm -hmm. and Jasmine being trapped in the hourglass? I'm like, those are such animation ideas. Yeah. that just mm -hmm. don't don't track in the, the real world. I, I, I can't imagine people are coming out of. Um, a lad, the live action lad, to say like, "Wow, I wish there were more CG." Uh, <laughs> <laughs> you know, b believe me, like it, uh, that wasn't that was never a goal, and so it was trying to make sure that it felt the the rules of the world felt largely consistent, and to the degree they can in a, a movie about a, a giant blue genie, mm -hmm. um, that it felt that it felt like okay, these are the things that can happen or cannot happen in, in our world. Yeah, awesome. Yeah. So one of the things that we were talking about in preparation for this was that you know with script notes and a lot of the different, you know, outlets that you have, you're kind of teaching screenwriting lessons and talking about analyzing film and, and teaching it. And so one of the things we talk about a lot is like, is there value in talking about, you know, how to tell stories? And is there a right way to talk about them and a wrong way to talk about them? Does it affect the viewing experience? So that was one of the things we just wanted to get your thoughts on is, is what is the value of teaching screenwriting? What is your what is your goal when you're creating something like script notes? Yeah. So with script notes, I've never perceived it as being educational in the sense that um, by listening to this, we are going to teach you how to do a thing. I mean, I, mm. I'm sure we say teach every once in a while, but it's never really been our goal. It's more just a conversation about what it's like to actually do the thing. And so the people who listen to us, a lot of them are working screenwriters who are doing this every day um, or they're studio executives, there are other folks who are in the industry or they're just interested in the industry. And so it's a chance to have a structured conversation once a week about this thing that we do, um, which is 
weird and has these esoteric, not even rules, but customs that you mm -hmm. have to sort of be aware of. And so I say I get as much about out of it as anybody because it's a chance to, for me to really think about why am I doing what I'm doing? And is that is it just me or does everyone else go through those same situations? And the mm -hmm. answer is almost always everyone goes through the same <laughs> situations and it's frustrating for everybody. I think it also came out of a sense of frustration that there's a whole cottage industry built around not even really teaching screenwriting, yeah. but you know, um, getting people's money to make <laughs> them feel like they have access to secret hidden wisdom of a screenwriting. And there's not secret hidden wisdom. Most of it's hard work. It's a lot of common sense. And there's a few things that are really good to talk about in terms of understanding how the form works. Um, so it's really been about trying to focus on those things rather than um, here, I'm going to lay out you know, the whole plan. Even although, even though, as I say that, the episode of Scriptness <laughs> that dropped today was called How to Write a Script. And it's, just, <laughs> and, it's, and it's just Craig for one hour talking about how to write a script. Oh, boy. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's something we talk about um, when we're doing our videos is it's one thing to look at a film or, or a screenwriting book and say, oh, here's a good lesson that you can internalize and, and take with you in the future. It doesn't mean every single movie has to do this one thing or else it's going to be bad. You know, it's just it's sort of like finding, like you said, those customs and those guidelines and those expectations. I liked on the uh, on the previous episode of Script Notes when the person said, oh, our our screenwriting teacher said we have to, oh, yeah. you know, do the, yeah. the three <laughs> or the six like major point. And both you and Craig were like, what? <laughs> I don't know what that is, you know, because yeah. everyone else has their own versions of what, you know, what that that structure is, that kind of thing. Yeah, it's fine to point out patterns and, and to observe that, you know, movies tend to do certain things because it's obvious and sometimes it's useful to point out the obvious things. Um, it's when it, those things become not descriptive but proscriptive that everything must follow this pattern that you end up with a lot of scripts that hit these beats but just don't function at all because they don't, the, the characters are not driving things. It doesn't feel like this movie wants to exist in a way. And I think that is ultimately what ends up stifling that initial spark of a great idea is all of this stuff being piled on top of it um, to to do the structurally movie things that you think a movie has to do that are squashing that that underlying great idea. Right. And it's actually, speaking of structure, it was something I was thinking about with, uh, with both Go and The Nines, where you kind of wrote a movie that's sort of three short films within this greater story. Yep. And I was wondering how much, when you're writing something like that, are you still thinking of the structure of the overall thing or, or how much are you thinking about the structure of the overall thing? I would say more than anything else, what I try to focus on, and I don't think people talk it enough about, is the audience experience moment by moment in terms of mm. where they're at and where they think they're going. Right. And, um, and the degree to which you can forget what you're doing as a writer and just see it as a viewer how do you make that experience as exciting as possible and as engaging as possible so they are so eager to see what's going to happen next? And with Go, it just starts really quickly and it sort of runs out of road and you're like, wait, wait, you ran out. Like, mm -hmm. And then the movie restarts and, and, and you see like, oh, there, there really is more. There's a plan. Trust me, this is going to work. Mm -hmm. um, the Nines is a similar case, but just taken to a much more extreme example where the movie stops dead and suddenly we're in a different movie and you as an audience are left wondering, wait, is this the same movie? Is this not the same movie? Are those, this, I recognize the same actors, but they seem to be playing different roles. What the hell is going on? And there's a little clue from the previous that you're like piecing it all together. Absolutely. So I'm giving you just a, just enough hints that like, no, no, really we are in the same kind of, there's a reason why this is happening. You got to trust me here. And I would say, not everybody trusts me there in the mm -hmm. nines, and that's totally fine and good, but that's why it's good to be able to make inexpensive experimental movies and not have to make everything be, you know, the blockbuster crowd pleaser. Returning a little bit to the process piece, so then do you have like some kind of structural beats or like outline format in your head that you use when you're first starting to like map something out? I don't. So I don't outline everything. Some things I need to outline just because I have to share with other people. Mm -hmm. I say that process where I'm going through to pitch something, it's going to very naturally feel like, okay, you can see what the three acts are probably going to be because we just, we've seen enough movies to have a sense like, okay, this is probably 
the first third of it, this is where we're we're setting up what the real problem is. This is probably the moment that's the the darkest, the worst of the worst, mm -hmm. and this is how it's going to resolve. And so, if you want to call that acts one, two, and three, that's great. But it's really getting back to the idea like stories are going to start, stories are going to end. If a if it's a movie, it's generally a character's one time experience. Like they're not going to do that same thing again the next week. So mm -hmm. it is very it is the biggest version of the journey that they're going to take. Um, so those are all natural things I'm thinking about as I'm, I'm putting together a story is, and, and how to, you know, make sure the conflicts are really clear, that the challenges are specific to that character, that they are both the best prepared and least prepared character for the situation I'm putting them in. All those things I'm thinking about, but I, I'm not fitting it into um, some sort of magical template where like, you know, every 20 pages, mm -hmm. <laughs> there has to be this, this kind of reversal because that's just, that's just not been my experience at all. I, I, it's, I've never done that. It's never been helpful. And whenever someone's tried to impose that kind of structure on things I've been doing, it's been a disaster. Yeah, that's kind of why I have a sort of love-hate relationship with screenwriting books mm -hmm. where I feel like some parts of some I found extremely useful and other parts I just drive me insane. And and I yeah, I like what you're saying because I feel like it's it's talking about trusting your intuition and and training, you know, having enough experience with the thing that you kind of know by heart the flow of what a thing should be so that then you can spend your sort of conscious, you know, energy finding new ways or exciting ways or just the best way to do it, not relying on, you know, the paint by numbers approach. And so I'm wondering for you, like, what, where do you feel like you learned storytelling? Like, what are the Ooh. ways that you kind of <laughs> I love this question. <laughs> like, yeah. explicitly or implicitly kind of trained yourself to, to think in this way? I would say, so my degree in undergrad was in journalism. And so we had to learn how to write, you know, this very classic news structure, this pyramid style where biggest and most important details are at the top. And then it sort of narrows down to uh, the kind of story that you could cut off at any paragraph and it would still make sense. Mm. I found it incred an incredibly frustrating form and I really struggled to write it. It wasn't until I discovered sort of the magazine form where like it is, you know, the piece is really designed to be kept whole and there's really a flow to it. It's like, oh, okay, this is sort of more my style. Um, but understanding all, all that said, screenwriting does have a relationship to that kind of news writing and that you are limited in what you can do and what you can say. You, I can only describe things you can see and you can hear. Mm -hmm. And it can give you some insight into characters' heads, but really only if they are playable. Um, I can give you mm -hmm. that parenthetical that puts a, a spin on a line, to a certain degree and, and figuring out what those commonly accepted boundaries are is, is part of the challenge of screenwriting. Um, but in terms of where I learned to sort of tell stories or sort of how I would tell stories, a lot of it is copying. A lot of it is yeah. seeing what a thing is that's out there that I'd like and then trying to reverse engineer like how did it actually work together? Mm -hmm. I grew up in a time when it was pre-internet and so it was very hard to find screenplays for anything. Mm -hmm. And I do remember watching an episode of Star Trek The Next Generation, um, recording it, and then just transcribing it all and trying to figure out like, wow. okay, well, what are the scenes? Like, what? how does it actually get through the stuff? Where are the act breaks? I had a sense that there were act breaks as it went into commercials. What is that like? And trying to figure out what that was. So I, I've always been the kind of kid who would take apart the toaster Mm -hmm. um, I was just going to say, <laughs> we all did that. You just did it with, with storytelling. Yeah. And, and so taking it apart that way was helpful. Um, w the danger is that in looking at how a few things work, you can overgeneralize like, oh, this is how all right. things work. And that's yeah. just not the case. Mm -hmm. Ooh, so this kind of, I don't know, this has been sort of nagging at me as we've been talking, but... So what role then we talked about, you talked about instinct, Michael, and I, you and Craig mentioned it, I think on your most recent episode of, of script notes, John, that, you know, you were doing this as a young kid, didn't take transcribing Star Trek and, and, and picking it apart. And it reminds me, I recently found a copy of one of my plays that I wrote when I was probably mm -hmm. six. Um, yeah. And it's for sure a ripoff of Jumanji, but <laughs> got, got some stuff in there. I feel there. like we all did that. Yeah, yeah. maybe. Um, but yeah, what role does instinct play? Do you have to have been a writer since you were 
six years old, since you could lift a crayon in order to be a screenwriter. I don't think you have to have started super early. I think you've had to have had an interest in story or interest in sort of that kind of thing early on, just so that you're noticing it. Um, because mm -hmm. it, it is, you know, 20 years of noticing how these things work does play a role. If you, I mean, if you were raised by wolves and suddenly came back into <laughs> civilization, I think it's unlikely that screenwriting would be your best <laughs> no. possible have profession. A really interesting story to tell. But. Yeah. Well, unless you not if you didn't know how to tell a story. Well, right. Yeah. <laughs> like what? I was raised by wolves. <laughs> <laughs> um, and I was largely raised by rerun television, and so mm -hmm. uh, watching every episode of Charlie's Angels, I did not think of as being research, but was incredibly good research mm -hmm. for. Oh, now I get to write Charlie's Angels. What does Charlie's Angels mean to me? Mm. Um, I read, you know, Roald Dahl's Charlie and the Chocolate Factory as a kid. Mm -hmm. Not that wasn't research for me. It was like just a book I read, but it had a very specific meaning to me, which was probably unique then to other folks. And mm -hmm. as I approached writing the story, I could really write it from the memory of what that felt like at that time. So there's, I don't think you have to have been raised in a screenwriting culture. I don't think you need to have had early exposure to that kind of stuff. But without having seen movies and television and read a bunch of stuff, I think it's unlikely that you're going to have just the, uh, you know, the scraps of cloth in your bag to sort of be able to sew together the next thing. Mm. Yeah. Interesting. I think, I think the, yeah, that idea of, like you were saying, transcribing the next generation, like the idea of taking apart the toaster, I think is a, a really cool idea because thinking back, you know, in my own history, that's absolutely what I was doing when I was making movies in middle school and high school was like, mm -hmm. I'm going to remake Indiana Jones or I'm going to remake The Matrix or whatever it was. And in doing that, you know, it's partially just fun and you want to mimic the things that you love. But I do remember going through that process and kind of stumbling upon like, oh, this is why the scene is like shot this way, because like if it's this other way, it doesn't work as well. So I think that is a really nice lesson and kind of a method that people can put into practice if if they're stuck and they want to learn more take something you love and then like take it apart like spend that time transcribe it mm -hmm. like in that process of just pulling out all the pieces you'll learn something about how those pieces get put together and the more you do that with different kinds of stories the more you kind of are, are learning you know the elements of of storytelling yeah, and getting back to something you alluded to earlier on is that there's that worry that like by understanding something too much, you'll stop enjoying mm -hmm. it, and that that doesn't really happen. So your example of you know why don't you remake Raiders of the Lost Ark? Um, I think the same way I could transcribe an episode of Star Trek. I know folks who are aspire to be directors who will just look at scenes and figure out okay what were the shots that actually mm -hmm. built that scene. So like how many setups would it take to get that thing, and that is crucial information and. All that is available to everyone in the world to try to do that kind of stuff. And so that is great. My experience has been that understanding the craft behind something generally does not interfere with your ability to enjoy it because if something's really working on screen, you stop. That yeah. pretty brain shuts off and you just enjoy it. It's when things aren't working that you start to notice like, oh, wow, they are really uh, they really need some singles here because they're stuck in this two shot and <laughs> this performance isn't working. You start to, you know, it's only when stuff is failing that your brain that has all that sort of special craft information kicks back in. I think I think a lot of times the that sort of analytical thing, it's just a, a decision we make to be snobs sometimes, you know, <laughs> like I can appreciate like a $300 bottle of whiskey. But then if I order like the well whiskey, I'm like, this tastes fine. I enjoy this. <laughs> you know, and I think that I, one of my frustrations is is the um, oh, have you read the books crew? You know, whether it's oh, yeah. Game of Thrones or any movie. And it's just like I'm not talking about the book. I'm not talking about the adaptation. I'm not talking about the changes. I'm talking about this thing in in and of itself you know but i think that we just sort of have this almost natural tendency to tell everyone how much smarter we are <laughs> yeah and like oh well that that story didn't work because there was no midpoint or whatever and it's like shut up <laughs> i mean i think i appreciate things more mm -hmm. because when you really know how challenging it is mm -hmm. like i was oh, sitting yeah. watching aladdin and i was like 
whoa, this would have been really difficult to do. (laughs) (laughs) I'm sure this was really difficult to do. You know, you're holding all of these beloved characters and this story that has to sort of be the same story, but you're trying to enrich it and give the audience something new at the same time, something relevant to what's going on right now that kids today can access while not breaking any of the pieces that they love. Just, I, I think I appreciate it so much more when it's executed well. It's it, it gives you so much more language to to understand and and process what you've just experienced. It's been interesting watching my mother go on that journey oh. because she was not a film person at all, and so sort of through my, you know, as I've learned about film and storytelling, she you know watches my videos or reads whatever, and so for a while she was like, "You've ruined movies for me. And like I can't <laughs> like not think about these things." But I feel like now she's kind of come out on the other side, and she'll see something, and then she'll call me and be like, "Well, I really liked how the protagonist was doing this," and like she's learned uh-huh. the lingo and kind of really has a, a deeper appreciation for when those things are working. So that's been fun. Hi, mom. <laughs> Hello, moms. Yes, my mom doesn't listen to my podcast, but she will. If I post anything on the blog, she'll read that. So I have to be very mindful of sort of what I post. <laughs> That's nice. So. That's funny. Well, one of the things I wanted to to talk about really quick was the apps that you are, yeah, an app developer. Um, oh, please. And I, I feel like that must tie into sort of your writing process and the you know the things that you wanted to solve you know, problems you were encountering that you felt there was a solution to. And so I think Highland is is the one, is like the big one, right? That's yeah. the, the screenwriting one. So I'm curious where that idea came from. I think like anybody who uses a certain tool all the time, you recognize that things you wish could work better or work differently, or you start to question like, wait, why are we doing it this way? So if I were a... Um, a person who used chisels all the time, and I would say like, you know what, these chisels are terrible and they break all the time. <laughs> um, I want some better chisels, and you wish somebody would make some better chisels. And I'm just the person who said who complains about things. It's like, oh, you know what, I'm going to fix that. I'm going to make some better chisels. Um, so Highland is an app that my company develops. Um, it started as a screenwriting app. I now use it for everything. So the the books I write, the Arlo Finch novels I write, I write those in Highland as well. It's meant to be just a a a simpler, smarter uh, way to write words and put them together. So for screenwriting, what I get so frustrated by with Final Draft and the things that work like Final Draft is they were solving a 20-year-ago problem yeah. where people were using Microsoft Word to write scripts. I had to write, <laughs> yep. um, I had to write uh, Go in Microsoft Word, and it's a challenge because oh you can use style sheets to some degree to sort of like mimic dialogue and stuff, but it's really rough. Yeah. And so... The people at Final Draft said, like, well, what if you could tell the app, like, what every element is, and then it would know where to put it. And so that's why you have to tab a certain number of times to get to yeah. character names and parentheticals and stuff. And it mostly works. But as a person who's, like, trying to put words on the page, it's just maddening to uh, to, to move stuff around and to really kind of fight with the app to tell it what you want things to be. Mm-hmm. Yes. Um, and so as a... <laughs> And so as a person who was working you know, on the web in early times, uh, when I discovered Markdown, which is a, a, a plain text way of, of creating HTML, I was like, well, how can we do this for the web and not do it for a screenplay page, which is much simpler than a web page? And uh, so we developed this way of describing what a screenplay page needs to be just with plain text. So you don't have to, you can just stop tabbing. And the, the application is smart enough to figure out like, oh, that must be a character name. The thing underneath the character name, I bet that's dialogue. Oh, it has parentheses around it? That's probably a parenthetical. Mm -hmm. And it just ends up, it sounds too simple and too easy, but when you're actually writing, it's just much faster. And because you don't have to think about what is that thing, you just type the words and they they go to the right places. And so that was the inspiration behind Highland. um, And it just, it formats stuff automatically. Having built that, I wanted to use it for everything. So we built in ways for you know, using it to write novels or the treatments or everything else I was handing in. Because once you start getting used to writing screenplays in that way, firing up Word or pages to do, you know, other stuff just became maddening because you're still having to tell the app what you want everything to be. A big thing for me is like the environment that I'm in when writing and 
when the device that you are using is a big part of that environment. And I remember just being so frustrated with Final Draft and trying to get it to just do what I want and stop messing up the things. And it was just a struggle <laughs> and there's all that visual clutter on the screen. So it was really, really exciting when I discovered Fountain and Highland and just the concept of Markdown. And what I also love is that it's it's such a clean interface that it's just everything goes away and it's just the like the blank screen and your text and it allows you to focus in a way that for me really helps me actually get stuff done. My most hated dialog box in Final Draft was the reformat command. So it's <laughs> command R and it pulls up this little floating window and you hit them like one, two, three, four, like to to reformat things that are completely broken in the document. Mm -hmm. And you get pretty good at doing it, but every time I had pulled up, I'm like, God damn it, I, I, I hate <laughs> I hate that this thing exists. And and even through all the iterations, they still have that same dialog box. Yeah. They like they made the buttons rounded, but it's still the same thing because right. it's still the same <laughs> kind of busted '90s idea of how screenwriting should work. And so we had the luxury, which they didn't have, of just like starting from scratch and say like, okay, what if we didn't do things the way that they've always been done? Yeah, and it's great. So thank you. Thanks. <laughs> Thanks. Oh. Uh, so this is the plug. Just it's 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 free on the Mac App Store, and and about the time is. Uh, podcast comes out to version 2.5 is out which does revisions and a lot of stuff so people will enjoy it yeah that's the other thing is that you know especially in this day and age it should be free like it should be accessible and i remember when i was a in in film school and having to like spend 120 dollars or however much it was to buy final draft and like get your registration cd for your right. computer and whatever yes. and it's just it, it's crazy that yeah. with with everything else being as accessible and um usable as it is to everyone right like film is we all make them now and we can all write them and so that really appreciate that about it thank you yeah, yeah i wanted to make sure that anybody who who wanted to try the app, who wanted to use the app, who wanted to do it for a class projects, whatever, it's there, it's free. Go use it, to try it. And if you want to do the fancy stuff, you can pay the 49 bucks to upgrade to the full, but you don't need the fancy stuff is the point, is that the fancy stuff is there to be helpful when you need it, but you can write your script without it. Yeah, it's great. And you also commissioned the design of uh, Courier Prime, the typeface, yeah. which I love. Anyone that's watched the Lessons from Screenplay videos, anytime there's screenplay on screen, you're looking at Courier Prime, which is much nicer to look at than the old school Courier new. So This <laughs> episode brought that. to you by Courier Prime. <laughs> <laughs> Courier Prime. Yeah, again, that, and that is a truly free, just for the world, just as a, you know, just a, a better courier that looks better with screenplays because screenplays don't have a lot of text on the page. And so courier, normal courier or courier new, all the variants, they'd end up being just too light and the, the page doesn't have enough density on it. I also wanted italics that looked good. And uh, so we have specially commissioned italics that really stand out and let you emphasize the things you want to emphasize. We'll let you go here in a second, but uh, I uh, wanted to ask you before you before we let you go, um, we just released a video on Minority Report. And in, in all of my research, I realized that you actually did a pass on that. I wonder if there's anything you could tell us about that process. Scott Frank is a master screenwriter and did amazing jobs for bringing a very difficult story to life. Um, I This is, again, a situation where I ran with the football for a few weeks and uh, was excited to do it and excited to sort of touch some things in there. Um, what I'll say, you know, I, I, the movie's great and people should check it out if they haven't seen it recently. Here's what I learned most in, in, in getting to help out on that for a little while is that so often there'll be a pressure to answer questions, to understand what the, mm. the, what's going to confuse the, the audience, what the, the questions the audience is going to ask. And the best thing a screenwriter can do is to take away those questions, to take away the ability to ask those questions. And so mm. really a goal of mine then, but I would say everything from that point forward is to anticipate what those questions are going to be and head them off before they can be asked. Um, so sometimes that is, you know, letting a character within a scene ask a question that sort of takes away a whole area of, of meaning. Um, other times it's just, visually setting up something about the rules quite early on so that a whole area of questions can't be uh, can't be there. But the more you have to explain and answer and fill in all those details, the less time you actually have to do the storytelling right. that you want to do. And so that was a, a great experience to be able to you know, run my fingers through that. 
So I guess that does answer the question that a lot of people had in our comment section, which was that the uh, last 20 minutes of the movie are all in his head and he's actually haloed in, in arrest. So that's not true, right? <laughs> I, I say that the movie that you see, I don't, I don't think that is true. Um, what I will say is that there were there were versions in which his being haloed. There, there was a, a longer sequence in which he was he was haloed and he was solving some stuff while being haloed. Mm -hmm. um, mm. That and so I could understand why the fact that that used to be a thing in there has sort of permeated the idea of, of sort of what that last bit of the movie is. But that was not the movie I see. I don't think that is actually the thing. Right. But I always find it fascinating when people have these fan theories about stuff, especially stuff that I worked on. Like, oh, all these things are connected in a beautiful <laughs> mm -hmm. way. It's like, no, they're not. Like Tim Burton's <laughs> movies, Tim Burton's movies are all connected in the sense that oh, yeah. Tim Burton has a very specific worldview and sort of like his brain works a certain way. So yes, they're all connected because they are all Tim Burton. Right. <laughs> um, but there's, I guarantee you, he does not, you know, spend you know hours in his little study figuring out like how everything is going to fit together he, no he's right. he's, yeah. he's he's busy making great movies yeah just one other thing i wanted to talk to you about because it's a particular passion of mine um so your first movie or you know we talked about go and that's very like sort of this edgy you know like teenage drug thing but then a lot of your work since then has been family friendly and and family focused um is that was is that something you're passionate about? Was that a choice or is it just sort of where you've ended up? It's where I've ended up, but I would say I ended up there in a deliberate way that, uh, you know, first, my favorite genre of movies are movies that get made. Yes. Um, so <laughs> uh, so you you don't see the silent evidence of all the things I wrote that aren't those movies right. that didn't get made for various reasons. So um, like I did an adaptation of Preacher, which I think is probably one of the best things I've written. Mm. It didn't get made. And that's Definitely not family friendly. Right. Um, so there's a lot of things like that where um, I have worked on them, but they haven't happened for one reason or another. I think largely because we we kind of we make big family movies and we don't make some of those other movies. Mm. So I think the other reason why I tend to write some of those is most of my work could be seen as a character, you know, stepping through into a, a fantastical world. So it could be a real world, but it's generally like characters living between two worlds. Even Big Fish is sort of mm. that kind of story. And uh, my brain kind of naturally goes that way. And most of those movies tend to be, you know, the PG-13s. Mm -hmm. And then with Arlo Finch, you know, you set out to write something. I just finished uh, Lake of the Moon, by the way, and it's really, really good read. So <laughs> thank you very much. Yeah. Um, well, I, I got the the first one for my my neighbor who's 10 and, and he really loved it. And so then we got the second one from the library. But, you know, you had an absolute pretty much absolute creative control on those, you know, and you decided to go with something middle grade fiction. Again, is that just something that you were passionate about? Some of those themes you wanted to explore? You know, I always say that people should write the things they wish they could read. Mm -hmm. And so that's the movie. Like, write the movie you wish you could see, the one that you would pay $10 to, to you know, go to see opening weekend, be that the giant blockbuster or the very, you know, esoteric, you know, clever indie movie. Mm -hmm. Write that movie. In the case of writing these books, I wrote the book that I wish I could have read mm -hmm. when I was 10 years old. That was really my goal. It's like, what would be my absolute favorite book? Uh, when I was that age. And so I, I tried to just write that book. And uh, it was a good experience. Writing books is really hard. Yes. It's, it's a, <laughs> that's a whole different podcast. It's really <laughs> tough. Um, but I have enjoyed having the absolute control over everything with that, um, mm -hmm. which is just such a different experience than what you get as a screenwriter. Yeah. And you have, well, you have deadlines now, right? Because now you have to do one a year or something. Yeah. So I, the third book is turned in. I just, as we were talking, I got my notes back. Oh, congratulations. I got my notes back from my editor. So uh, there's there's more revisions to happen, but those revisions are a different class because it's not, nothing is you must do this thing. It's like, well, here are some options um, or it's like, you use the wrong word here. You got to fix this word. <laughs> right. <laughs> right. Yeah. What a good experience. I don't know. I'm jealous. I feel like that's something I want to do at some point in my life. I, I've written a nonfiction book, but I have not written a novel. And it's something I'd love to try to do. Well, I would say I started this book series uh, during NaNoWriMo, National Novel Oh yeah, uh, Writing November. Month. Uh, where, yeah, November, where you just, you just try to crank through a full book. And it's a lot, but for a month you can do it. And you you get a lot of words you know, under your fingers and somehow they become a book. <laughs> That's awesome. 
in this case, a really entertaining book. So if you guys haven't Thank checked you. out Arlo Finch, check it out. They're both of the ones that are out right now are a really, really good read. Cool. Thank you. Yeah. Cool. Well, so to wrap it up, why don't we quickly go around and say what we've been watching recently, what people should check out. I recently finally saw Molly's Game, which I really enjoyed. It was, I was obsessed with Aaron Sorkin for a long time, then kind of got worn out with Aaron Sorkin-ness. So I was a little <laughs> bit worried about written and directed by Aaron Sorkin. And mm-hmm. it, it is very Sorkin, uh, but I really enjoyed it. I thought it was, a, it's him kind of in the arena that he likes to play in. And it was a very entertaining couple hours so i recommend checking that out awesome great yeah brian i'm uh very excited because one of my favorite shows just came back on tv it's an australian show so if you're in australia you probably already know about it if you're in the states then you have to find tricky ways to watch it but the first five seasons are on netflix it's a show called wentworth um and it's set in a uh it's a drama set in a women's prison and if that sounds familiar, no, it makes Orange is the New Black <laughs> look like a cartoon. Like it's Whoa. much more Breaking Bad than Orange is the New Black. Um, and uh, it's just it's just a great show. Um, it's a 95% female cast, as you would expect. And they all just are like incredible actors and give these like very raw performances. The only interesting thing is sort of like the story is kind of being done told that was starting to be told at the beginning. So it's sort of like, now let's just see what we can do with these characters now. And, you know, mm-hmm. it's still a great show, but it's not quite the same show. Um, but if anybody's interested in checking it out, it's on Netflix. And the first episode is all you need. You know, some they say, well, get into the second season. No, episode one of Wentworth is this is the ride you're taking. So check it out. Awesome. Great. I am not just saying this, but I really have been watching Chernobyl and it is amazing and haunting and horrifying everything that you have heard about it there's rightfully a lot of buzz about it it's excellent um on every level i'm i actually a a rewrite for an industrial disaster movie fell into my lap so i'm working on that right now and it's Chernobyl is just providing me so much inspiration about navigating all the different angles that you have to sort of try to have when you're working on something like this. And of course, just the unspeakable tragedy of kind of to watch it holding my pillow and halfway crying. But yeah, it's really, really good. Yeah, I can't wait to check that out. Yeah. All right, so Trisha, you took my Chernobyl. So Craig Mason, of course, my co-host uh-huh, for Chernobyl. See? So I can't, I can't recommend that. So um, but I do think it's great. I will instead reach way back to uh, Game of Thrones. So I, I watched all Game of Thrones. My daughter uh, wanted to start watching Game of Thrones, oh, and so we're letting her watch one one a night. It's it's, it's a little harrowing for uh, a teenage girl, but uh-huh. but also you know what the, the times we live in. But I will say it's fascinating going back and looking at at early Game of Thrones because. Um, they knew what they were doing. There's so many things where it's just like having been through the end, it's like, oh, yeah, you know what? You did set that up. I forgot that you set that up because seven seasons and like 500 characters later, but like mm-hmm. that moment was right there and 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 well done you. So it's it's also very exciting to see like a young Arya Stark and seeing all these mm-hmm. people who look like children because they were children. So uh, um, if, if, you, if you're considering cycling back to the start of Game of Thrones, having finished it, uh, I would recommend it. It's it's surprisingly rewarding to go back to the beginning. And I also I have a new appreciation for the folks who'd read all the books and sort of knew what was going to be happening, mm. um, what it must have feel like for them to have started watching the show because they're like, ooh, ooh, that, that thing he's saying right now, that's going to become really important <laughs> a very long time later. Mm-hmm. And so to finally actually have that ability now is kind of cool. Yeah. Awesome. Yeah. Cool. Well, John, thank you so, so much for coming on the show. A pleasure. With us. Um, Where can people find you if they want to find you? So my website is just johnaugust.com. I'm on Twitter and Instagram at John August. And then Script Notes is the best way to listen to me and Craig talk about things. Uh, Just search for Script Notes wherever you listen to this podcast. Awesome. All right. Great. Thanks, John. (laughs) Great. Thanks so much. Thank you. Thank you, John. All right. Bye. Bye. Bye.